Today we're going to talk a little bit about designing complex state machines. We know from our designs of the Mealy and Moore machines using JK flip-flops and combinatorial logic that once you get past about four states and maybe four input variables, the complexity of the system can become unmanageable. It becomes rather awkward and really impractical to build uh, state machines that are anything beyond more trivial examples. But there is a way to jump an order of magnitude and complexity quite easily and to build state machines that are very, very versatile and very powerful with very simple hardware architecture. Here's an example of a state machine that is running 16 states. If we get to a point in the LED sequence where we can start counting, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, you notice that some of the states I had doubled the time by simply outputting the same LED pattern twice. It gives us the appearance of a delay, but that's actually just two states in a row that have the same output. So that's 16 states. And here we have a very, very simple hardware arrangement. Uh, over here we have our clock, our 555 timer, which is outputting 3 hertz for this example. Here we have our, um, we have a latch, it's a hex D flip-flop, and all that does is it gets clocked by the, the clock to freeze the state so that it actually steps and states running then, rather than running freely. And here we have a an EE prom that we're using only a very very tiny fraction of the memory in there probably less than one half of one percent so we're running 16 states this is a 32k EEPROM and obviously they they get much larger than that so you can build extremely versatile state machine systems using EE proms and something like flash memory you could actually uh, download new um, state machine sequences or new programs if you want to look at it like that in the field um, so they can be field programmable to change the behavior of the state machines so let me give you um, a little bit of a quick look at the schematic and also how the data and the address fields are divided up to form these kinds of PROM state machine functions. Well this shows really just how simple the hardware configuration is. Here we have a 555 timer putting out a 3 Hertz pulse to this latch chip here which is a 74HCT174. It's a hex um, D flip-flop chip. So all it's doing is it's looking at the information at its inputs here and then when it gets a clock pulse it latches that information and shows it at its output. The output of this latch chip is going to the input or the address field of this prom. Now most of the address lines are tied low because we're only using uh, as I said less than one half of one percent of the capability of this chip we're only using 16 data locations in this chip and addresses a address bits a0 uh, a4 through a14 are unused so that just gives you kind of a, an idea of what the tremendous expansion capability that you might have in a system like this so let's just assume that the system starts out and we have all zeros here at our address so we're in address location 0 now the data the one byte of data at address location 0. The lower four bits are used to uh, turn on the LEDs in whatever pattern we want. And then the upper four bits are used as a next state variable fed back here to the input of this latch. Now it's sitting here at the input of the latch but that's different than what's here at the output of the latch when the clock signal goes low what's going to happen is it's going to latch this information and pass it through and hold it stably here at its outputs and that becomes our address location for our next state so we have tremendous versatility and these chips are typically CMOS and TTL compatible 
so we don't have to worry too much about driving LEDs from them. As long as we have some reasonable current limiting resistors here, I'm using 1Ks, it won't stress this chip at all. So here we have just uh, three chips and we have an extremely versatile state machine. Okay, here is how the address and data fields are segmented uh, in this state machine. We're only using the lowest four bits of the address field. So we have much more flexibility there. We could use these additional address fields as inputs for variables, so various input variables, switches, states of various hardware, equipment, or whatever, in order for us to decide what state we need to go to next and what our output conditions need to be. However, we only have 8 bits of data, and part of the data field needs to be used as a next state field. In this case, we have to match if we're going to use 4 bits address, we have to have 4 bits reserved as, uh, as our next state field in our data um, register. So as we can see, this could we could very quickly run out of space here because we also need to use the data uh, field as uh, commands for our output. So these are our outputs. And What's nice about this machine is that if you're active low, you can just invert the, um, the bits. And this is what these LEDs are active low. So you can see the LEDs sequencing through that pattern that you saw here, the, the, the double bits down here um, that made it look like it had a delay. So what do we do if we need, let's say... Um, 32 states or 64 states or 128 states. Well, what you can do is you can either find a PROM that has 16-bit um, data. Their data organized as 16 bits or even possibly 32 bits. But you have to realize how many pins that chip is going to have on it. So if you if you need, you need quite a few address uh, bits because 8 bits, byte wide is only going to give you 256 bits, so obviously you typically go up to 13 or 14 or 15 um, address bits, so that's you know possibly 12, 13, 14 pins on the chip. If we add another 16 pins for data out, you, that's a very large chip. So what you can do though is you can take two of these um, 8 bit data chips and you can put them in parallel so you run the addresses you have plenty of address space and th that in that dimension you have plenty of room you don't have much dimension in the room of the the data field so what you can do is you can run the same address information to two proms in parallel and then program them one prom as the upper uh, byte and one as the lower byte and get your 16 bits because very quickly, um, all you need is a couple of more bits here in, in your next address field, and uh, you will have more uh, states than you could ever need. So with 16 bits, you should be able to do just about anything you could imagine. And of course, you need a way to program the PROMs. Uh, this is the machine I use. Um, this is the hardware part of it. Runs off USB. It's uh, relatively inexpensive. It costs less than a compiler for uh, for a um, system on chip like a um, microchip or something like that. So um, you can always also get these things to where they will test any kind of logic hardware for you, and these machines will program a very vast array of different kinds of devices. So let's take a look at the. PC end of the um, PROM programmer in terms of the editor. I'm going to turn the hardware on now. So we're here the USB recognizing the device and I will open up the program. Here we have uh, first thing we want to look at is to see that we have selected the proper uh, device. Uh, several ways that we can do that. We can um, we can select from a list of devices that we've used previously like this or we can um, just select a device from scratch based on the um, 
manufacturer and the part number. We have our device selected. So usually what I like to do when I'm working with a new device, uh, this device is the one that I just pulled out of the breadboard. So um, first of all, let's, uh, let's read that prom. I'm going to come up here and, and read this. And it says that it read it successfully. If we come up to the editor, now we can look at the data in that prom. So here we see the data in, in hex. We can also look at it in binary, which is useful sometimes. And here we can look at the, uh, the upper nibble, which is the, uh, the next state, and the lower nibble, which is the command to the LEDs, with the zero being um, uh, active state in that lower nibble because it's uh, reverse logic. We want to ground it in order to sink more current. Um, but typically if I'm using a, a new prom, what I will do is I will erase the prom, come up here to the upper menu and I will say erase. Now that prom is erased. It says the erase is okay. I want to load my buffer file that I've been working with and I load that in here and I select my buffer that I have been working with in this case it is uh, buffer 3 now if I open the edit window again I can see this is the data from, from buffer 3 obviously we've erased the chip so it's not from the chip now I want to program the chip with the data in this buffer so I'll come up here to the upper left icon where it says program I press that I got a successful program indicator here and um, if I want to what I can do is is verify it verified okay also by the way the hardware is giving me indications that things are successful because you can set this program up so that you can work with your programmer on the bench and it has a start button and it has various feedback LEDs to show you that the uh, operation was a success or not. Um, so I, I verify it against the buffer, it verifies okay. The other thing I can do is I can read it. If I read it, now I have read it. If I open up the editor I will see exactly the same information obviously that I had loaded previously from my buffer file. You can also uh, save a project which will save some environment uh, information from the session that you're working on if you're working with different kinds of chips. It will save what kind of chip that you're programming and that type of thing. But as you can see, this is uh, very easy to work with. You can work with the data in uh, binary, hex, 8-bit, um, 16-bit, 32-bit format, whatever you want. And then you can just very easily uh, save this as as a external file you can also even edit it with an external editor and bring that in and program your chips using that so it's very easy